Hi, welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, uh, loads of cross-country news, bizarrely. So there's a new Fox Super Light seat post, uh, there's new bikes from Santa Cruz and from Juliana, uh, some really cool bike caves and a bike announcement from ourselves at GMBN. Now straight into this week's show, I'm not really going to talk about a topic as such, but just going to kind of involve it with news because there seems to be a lot of development suddenly sort of coming to fruition in cross country. Uh, it pleases me because cross country and the race format is my favourite one to watch. Uh, I just think, you know, you just can't beat the head to head racing format, I just think it's so good to watch. And it's really quite cool because let's face it, we see a lot of enduro bikes and loads of enduro development and a lot of it shares similarities with the gravity side of things that we see in a downhill scene, but cross country is kind of, has been left to its own devices. And to a large degree, I think a lot of people think cross country is a bit backwards in terms of development, but that's not necessarily true. There's some really cool stuff going on. So yes, they have kind of settled largely on fairly standard geometry. So it'd be about 68 degrees on the head angle, about 74 on the seat angle, around 430 to 435 on the rear end there, typically using a longer crank. But more often than not these days, starting to use dropper posts and some other technical uh, aids in their riding, which is quite cool. So we've seen some decent development and it really pleases me because I love the purity of what cross country is, um, man or woman and machine against the elements and against other races directly. I just think it's so exciting. Uh, and there's some great stuff. So let's jump into news with some of the cool stuff. So first up, Fox have got their transfer SL seat post out. So this could well be the largest, um, largest, the lightest uh, dropper post on the market. Now, not in including any sort of super bespoke, you know, tiny boutique brands. This is a major manufacturer here. So this is 25% uh, lighter than their standard version of the transfer, which is still available. Um, but the cool thing about this, uh, this is it on screen here. So yep, it looks just like the transfer, but there's no hydraulic action in this. So this is where they get rid of a load of the weight. Cause you're thinking hydraulic posts as well as fluids and other stuff on the inside, you've got uh, loads of seals and things, everything adds up. So this post is from 327 to 342 grams. Yeah, that's seriously light. So that's 128 grams lighter than the regular transfer post, but also than the DT inverted carbon post. In fact, uh, that post weighs 369 grams, uh, and it previously was the lightest one, which I thought was insane. Uh, I actually had one of those that arrived on, um, on my Canyon Lux, but I couldn't get a post high enough, so I swapped that one out. But that post was 60 mil travel and the cool inverted carbon design, um, which I thought was the lightest, is no longer the lightest. So pretty cool stuff from Fox. So it's available in 27.2, uh, 30.9 and 31.6, but in the 27.2 it's slightly different because the fact you have to engineer the post differently because it is that much smaller. So it's available in 50 and 70 mil drops in the 27.2 that you can see here. And the 30.9 and 31.6 come in 75 and 100 mil drops. So this is clearly focused at sort of the gravel, uh, the cross country, the sort of endurance format of riding. Don't confuse that with enduro. Uh, talking about things like uh, multi-day racing, like the Cape Epic sort of stuff. Now the 27.2, because the fact it has a slightly different design, there is one thing you should know about it. So it has got, you're gonna have a very teeny amount of movement in this, just as you would with virtually any seat post on the market, because it uses a regular pin and groove or um, key and groove format to stop the post moving side to side. But on the larger diameter posts, it's a slightly different design. So uh, Fox say that the, the larger damage supposed to use preloaded anti-rotation bushings on them. So that's kind of interesting. So they say there's no movement at all, side to side, which is great, but it can move side to side if it's hit in an impact. So uh, kind of a cool feature there, I think. Again, uh, it's a mechanical operation. So it's got a coil spring on the inside, which I was kind of thinking, hmm, it's gonna be quite a bit heavier because that's surely, but because of the fact that there's nothing else in the post, the core spring doesn't have to support your body weight because it locks top and it locks at bottom. It's literally to return the post. So actually, it's a really lightweight core spring in there. Uh, so yeah, arguably it's gonna be much faster to return uh, than a, a, a damped, like um, an oil damped C post. But that's the kind of trade-off you get for getting it so light. Uh, there's a factory model, uh, which has got the Kashima coating, and then there's the performance model, which has got the regular black coating on there. 
Now the factory model actually comes with titanium hardware as well, so it's a further 10 grams weight loss. Uh, 399 and 329 uh, US dollars currently. I don't have the European pricing on those, but you can get a rough indication from there. Okay, next up, the Santa Cruz Blur. So we've teased this before, you've seen it in the races, we've seen this thing uh, doing the rounds already, and now it's available. So this is it, there's a whole bunch of great pictures, and actually their launch video with Maxime Moreau is great. I urge you to watch that, there's gonna be a link in the description underneath so you can watch that one. So here's the frame, it uses the new Super Light suspension platform. Now if you remember, the Santa Cruz Super Light was a model of bike, now Super Light is their new suspension platform on there. So the cool thing about this, uh, so the bike has got a low leverage curve, they say it naturally offers higher anti-squat without them having to engineer uh, loads of anti-squat into the design. So this means being a short travel bike, it's gonna be very supple. So great stuff there from Santa Cruz. Um, single pivot, linkage driven, and it has seat stay flex on there. 29 inch wheels only. Now there's also a TR model. So if you remember the Blur used to come in the Blur and the Blur TR, which is like the trail or the slightly longer travel version. Now the TR model, you can either buy it as a TR or you can alter the shock on it and do it yourself. So the cool thing about the TR is it's 115 on the rear and 120 on the front, whereas the regular Blur is 100 mil front and rear. The TR model uses a 45 mil stroke shock whereas the Blur uses a 40 mil stroke shock, so you can actually tweak that. Uh, both shocks fit both frames there, so you can actually go between them. And they do a carbon and the carbon like the CC, so C and the CC models. So you've got a slightly more uh, budget conscious version and the full all out racing one. So the frame is 289 grams lighter than the previous VPP model of the Blur. So that is why they've done this for this World Cup style bike. Uh, ultimately, just to get rid of any weight that you just don't really need for that specific purpose. Uh, like I said on last week's show, and probably the one before, they're just, they're making this bike to be a contender basically, along with all of the other super light race bikes. It's kind of a very different breed of bike from the sort of the more the trail friendly bikes out there. Uh, angles on the bike. So it's got 68.3 head angles, so fairly standard there. Uh, it's got 76 to 75.7 degrees seat angle, depending on the size there. Chain stays are size specific, which is cool. 430 up to 438 across those uh, four sizes. And the reach on them, 425 and up to 495. So 495 on the XL. That's pretty good. Um, I would love a cross country bike with just a little bit more reach. Now, you know, I wouldn't be confusing it with just trying to make the bike big and aggressive and not what it's supposed to be, but uh, most extra large cross country bikes tend to be about 480 and that's what mine is. I would love it to be just that little bit longer so I can run a slightly shorter stem, uh, but the angles are fine. I wouldn't want to really change that stuff. Uh, so that would be cool to see on some other bikes in the future, but uh, uh, this one's already doing it. Lifetime frame warranty, lifetime bearing warranty on there, which Santa Cruz do across the board. Uh, frame pricing, uh, the CC model and the TRCC. Uh, 3,399 US dollars and builds from 4,599. I think it's really cool. I reckon that's a super nice. What do you think? Okay, next up, uh, the Giuliani equivalent of the TR model. Now note they're not doing currently a Giuliani version of the Blur, they're just doing it of the Blur TR. Uh, and I, I would assume it's because they've got a cross country World Cup race team and they do four sizes in the actual blower we're only doing three sizes in the Juliana. Uh, so it's essentially the same frame uh, with the Juliana styling and fit on there. Uh, so it looks great as well. So this is it, 115 mil travel, 120 mil up front. It's got independent launch video, really cool stuff. Um, dare I say the color's a bit cooler as well. Um, I might be alone on that, but I think it looks really cool. Like the predictable one for the race bike that you would have for you know, the Santa Cruz FSA team riding, it does look brilliant. Uh, and I'd be happy with one of those all day long. But I've got to say, Giuliano, I've always been a fan of their colors, almost more so than the regular Santa Cruz ones. Um, again, I might be alone, but um, so uh, like I said, 29 inch wheels, 120 up front, 115 out back, small, medium and large, head angle is 67.1. Uh, seat angle, again, size specific, very slightly different. So 75.1 up to 74.9. So just a teeny bit slacker there. Uh, 431 to 436 mil chainstay, 412 to 458 mil reach there. Uh, builds, they could do a C and a CC carbon in those. And the frame set comes in C only at 3,339. And the builds are from 4,599. Yeah, I'm definitely a Juliana fan. I think they look really, really sorted. Okay, so next up in news, uh, we've got a new bike partner. Yeah, we're gonna be riding with Orbea. So this is seriously exciting stuff to me because 
I don't really know a massive amount about all bias. I've really started looking into it. You know, they've been around since 1930, making bikes, that is. Uh, before that, they were making guns and rifles and stuff. And uh, it's an old company. Uh, so I'm going to seriously like nerd out on this stuff because uh, any company has been making bikes that, that amount of time has got to be good in my book. So they're based in the Basque region, so up in northern Spain there. Uh, somewhere I've never actually been. Uh, it's high on my list of places to go for both riding, of course, and then the coastal ports with their famous tapas and seafood and stuff. Just sounds like part of the world that I really should sort of uh, well, move to, really, to be honest. This sounds perfect. But the bikes, so they've got some seriously cool bikes in a range. Uh, on screen is one of their cross country bikes. This is the Alma. Um, it's cross country hardtail. It's a super light bike. In fact, I think that one there um, is probably about three pounds lighter than my Lux. So I thought that I've got it good with the Lux because of the fact it's a super light bike. It fits me great. I want to go and ride the thing all the time. Um, and I've never looked at cross country hardtails because if I'm honest, I kind of feel like I've um, gone past hardtails now. Uh, now that I found a bike that's so efficient for what I want, but this might change my mind a bit because it's just bonkers the way it's made and how light the frame is on there. So they did a frame in a couple of different orientations, so they still look the same. They've got what they call OMR and OMX frame designs. So the OMR for a size medium is 1,100 grams, pretty light, but the OMX is like 830 grams. That's like road bike territory. That is seriously, seriously light. Now, Rich has been riding one of these and he says this thing goes like, it goes like a very fast thing. Uh, I was gonna say something that I probably shouldn't have said then. Uh, but you get the picture, this bike is a seriously fast cross country bike and actually really appeals to me at the moment. So uh, I'm gonna get to have gone on this one. So uh, get some pedals bolted on there. Uh, notice it's got a 27 two seat post. So there's no dropper post on there currently. Um, I'm gonna try it as it is, I think, because Curiosity killed the cat and all that stuff, but what a beautiful looking bike. So there's some more shots of it on screen here. What else? Right, so right next to me here, if you're just about to see it in the corner, is this absolutely gorgeous red trail bike. So this is the Occam. So it's got a single pivot on the rear. It's got some sort of concentric pivot around the rear axle. So think along the lines of the split pivot or a Trex ABP, same concept. So it's still, Rides like a single pivot bike, i.e. because there's no pivot between the rear axle and the main pivot there, uh, but it has a braking characteristics um, more attributed towards a linkage bike like a four bar, where you have the chainstay pivot there. So a really cool way of tweaking the suspension design and getting the sort of anti-rise effects that the designers want from it. So it's got a linkage driving the shock there and it's got this really cool asymmetrical frame design on it. So um, I can't wait to, no, this one here I'm gonna take for a while. I'm not gonna swap a few things out on this and get this all dialed in the way I like it. But the frame design is absolutely beautiful. And again, this is a pretty light bike. Geometry on it, it depends because you can have it, well, it's a 140 back end. Or you can have it the 140 or a 150 fork on there. So it's 65 and a half or 66 degree. Uh, head angle on the front there. Uh, seat angle on them is 77 degrees. So nice and steep on there. Like everything is about where it should be. 425 to 500 mil reach across all the sizes there. I make a lot of good bikes, and there's a lot of cool things you can do with them, including full customization of the spec and the colorway on them. So you can effectively have custom paint jobs on their bikes. Uh, but interesting stuff, um, it's a new bike for me to ride, so I'm seriously excited to find out more about the brand. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna see them popping up across the channels uh, over, well, starting now. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the comments from last week's show. Uh, first up from Chris Ingram. I bought a second-hand fork with two short steerer tube. It was a uh, RockShox RS1, so it had a proprietary front hub, so I also bought a wheel set, and then ended up buying a new frame. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty expensive mistake. Uh, it seems there's loads more people who've had roof rack incidents. Uh, sounds like a pretty common one. Uh, and, and just horrible to be fair. And I read a couple actually, it sounded like bikes that uh, lost their way off the back back of the car as well at some point. Not a nice thing to happen. Uh, Mick Schwabel, Rock shocks, uh, in reference to Fox or Rock shocks, because you can service everything by yourself without spending more money for the special tools uh, than the actual shocks themselves. Um, yeah, to a degree, um, I agree with you, but you do still need some tools. I mean, if you want to change the fork seals, arguably you could pull the seals out with a ring spanner and you could find a way of tapping them in, but you really kind of need the right tools to seek that sort of stuff. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's Fox or Rock shocks or Suntour or any other brands, you will need those. But yeah, I think I agree on the large part, RockShox does feel quite user-friendly. Um, and it does seem that a lot of you agree on that as well in the comments, since there's a lot of RockShox fans. 
Now, quite a lot of people mentioned Ned Overend, which is interesting. Um, I've completely forgotten about Ned, and I don't know, don't know how, because I think it, his career probably started at a similar time to Hans. It was like, it was, well, mid 80s, around that time. He's been with Specialized the entire time, and he's still working with Specialized. I'm not quite sure when he stopped racing and you know being a rider for them. He's running teams and doing. He's a brand ambassador now. So, so yeah, technically, I mean, the guy's a legend. He's always been around. Didn't have a weird nickname. It's like the Lung or something, wasn't it? Because people just couldn't beat him on um, courses with a lot of elevation or something. Um, mental. And he was quite old for an XC racer as well during his day. Um, and let's also not forget Tinker Juarez. Uh, Tinker's still riding for Cannondale. He's been with Cannondale since. I don't know, he's 25, 26 years, maybe 27 years. Uh, so yeah, there's a few proper long timers out there, but I think, I'm, think I'm still right in saying that Hans has got, had the longest with a single brand that he's still actually riding for them, uh, not just being a brand ambassador or doing other things. Um, either way, there's a load of amazing old school riders out there. They're still doing it, so really cool to see. Uh, next up from Dan Pratt. I'm here to let everyone know about an important experiment I've conducted and the results are in. Tan sidewall tyres make you 18% faster, tested on a 1.2k downhill track, and 100% cooler than anywhere else, uh, than, than anyone else. I'm kind of with you there, I do love a tan wall tyre, but it's only on the right bike. I think a dirt jump bike, tan walls look really, really cool on there. Uh, and I also think on cross country bikes, but I wouldn't have them on any other type of bike, I don't think. Um, what do other people think? Tan walls, yay, nay, or on what sort of bikes? They're obviously quite popular at the moment because you've seen them on gravel bikes and a few different brands like Maxxis are doing them, obviously Vittoria do them. Uh, I think we've seen some WTB ones as well. Um, yeah, there's a few brands out there doing them. Schwalbe as well, do a tabletop tyre. I think they're really cool, but again, on the right bike. They don't always look right. They can look a bit weird. Euro old school, not quite cool. Uh, let's not also forget that uh, some cheap bikes used to come with sort of uh, gum wall tires. They weren't the same as the town wall tires you get in the quality world. Um, but the association of having a tire that's not black kind of made them feel a bit like not cool back in the day. Uh, and the move to black wall tires was seen as like, no, you have to black wall, they look really cool. I like them both. Um, yeah, see what you think in the comments. Uh, interesting stuff though, Dan. 18% uh, quicker, eh? Uh, loads of positive comments on Hans, which is cool to see. Uh, Marciano says, Hans Ray, one of the greatest bike riders ever. People should definitely check him out, specifically the early stuff in the 80s. Uh, dude was and still is amazing on his bikes. Uh, yeah, I, I forget what his original video was. It is on his YouTube, but he, you know, he used to live with Rodney Mullen, like the Rodney Mullen from the skate world. Like, pretty big time, you know, living with a skater of that quality and, you know, sort of that sort of legacy. Um, and Hans has had some incredible friends and friendships over the years. Uh, you can see how it sort of influenced and shaped him as a rider and a sort of a, um, an ambassador as well. Awesome stuff. Yeah, and I love all his early videos. There's one clip in particular, actually, where his old house that he was living in had like a, an incredibly steep front garden, went down to the road, and he had a little bit of trail where you could ride. And in the clip, he's on, I think, XTR, like a cantilever brakes. They're not even V brakes. And you can tell he's like fully like squeezed to the bar and he's still speeding up. And he's like, ah, like holy shit, sort of thing. Uh, it's a great clip, pretty funny. It looks almost wildly out of control, but somehow just like rides off smoothly. And it's good. Um, Frank Ricard says, I'm still running a 2005 Marzocchi fork to this day. Uh, very few options for adjustment, but they're pretty good from the factory. They're cheap, they're easy to maintain, and they last forever. I just don't understand why open bath is not more common anymore. Uh, maybe the weight of the extra fluid is a concern. I don't know. Um, do you know what? I, I don't really know either, to be honest. I could imagine the weight would be a thing, having all that oil sloshing around on the inside does weigh, but then you've got oil in the bath at the bottom, you've got oil inside the damper. Um, I can't imagine it's just the weight thing though, to be fair, it's the design that they can actually get with the cartridge designs uh, on the inside using the bladder system. They're able to like control the oil flow probably probably a bit better with uh, smaller components and stuff in there. So yeah, there will be a weight factor in it, but it won't just be the volume of oil in it, it will be the other things. Um, interesting, I'm gonna ask a few brands actually what they think about oil bath forks um, versus cartridge style forks. It's an interesting question. Okay, so uh, next up, let's jump into the quiz. Right, so what we've got this week, first question that comes up on screen right now. What makes, or what helps make, the brand new Santa Cruz Blur so light? Next question, what did Orbea make before bikes? Yeah, they've been around way longer than I ever realized. I actually thought they were relatively new to the off-road scene. I uh, didn't realize what history they had in the road world. But uh, yeah, what did they make before bikes? 
interesting stuff. And what, finally, uh, what is the benefit of having Kashima coating uh, on Fox products? Or Fox suspension forks, uh, Fox telescopic seat posts, things like that. We'll pick up the answers in a bit. Okay, so now let's jump into Bike Cave. This is all about showing off your cool workshops, your garages, your space under the stairs. Anything goes as long as that's where your bike lives. That's what we want to see. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the screen and another one in the description underneath. Please do get involved. Feel free to send us any sort of uh, video clips as well. Always nice to see those. Uh, don't get too many of them. I keep asking for them. It'd be nice to see some video clips. Nice to hear what you all sound like out there. Uh, first one's from Carl in Wirral. And he says, after having my bike cave on a couple of times, yeah, I was gonna say, I thought I recognized the blue in there. Um, I've made some changes, like a TV that links up to my laptop so I can stream GMBN Tech and GMBN and other MTV programs. And I've added more muck off um, mats on the worktop, painted the homemade shelves, added some plastic drawers to put some of my biking gear, loving the GMBN channels. Dude, you've done quite a lot here. So yeah, I remember like bench grinder. Man, you really love the muck off stuff. Although to be fair, that's a really good idea. It's a real easy way of making it look like a proper finished workshop, isn't it? Yeah, good stuff. Now next up's from Dave in Lincolnshire. Through lockdown, I decided to upgrade my workshop with the aid of Chris Longbone. No way, from Retro Bike, aren't I, Chris? Rad. Um, we extended my existing garage and built a place to sit and drink beer after the rides. Yes, or just drink beer and talk about bikes. There's another thing you could do. Whoa, look at those spinning G wheels down the back. Like they're kind of disgusting, but amazing, aren't they? I always wonder what would happen if you had a crash and you got your arm or your foot stuck in one of those. Would it just smash the wheels a bit? So would it like lop a limb off? Um, because they're pretty sharp feeling, aren't they? Pretty gnarly things. Whoa, retro helmet there with a Troy Lee peak. Is that a bit of mint source artwork as well at the back there? Like it, it looks like you've also got um, a repack poster just like that one, in fact. It looks identical. Nice, the Ford sign on the wall. Loving the little L-shaped sofa in the wall. Also, little, love the L-shaped so sofa in the corner. It does look inviting. Yeah, really like it, mate. Awesome stuff. Oh, okay. Klein Pulse 2. <laughs> Lovely looking bike. And actually, the wheels, although they're strange, they just suit the bike perfectly, didn't they? Uh, Porcupines, Salitalia Flight, Syncross Post. Lovely stuff. Really nice to see. I'm liking your like the shelves that you've built to hang the bike on. That's, I'm gonna copy that idea. Do you reckon that if you're watching this, you could just take a few more shots with the bike off, just so I can have a look at that. Um, I've got a very special bike that's been loaned to me by the owner, and I wanna hang it up in the new GMBN Tech set. I'm gonna basically scrap the set and redo it, because I really wanna make room for it. It's probably the most important mountain bike in Europe, um, and I wanna make sure it has a good home on display, and I really like what you've done there. That looks good. I'd rather do that than have like an official um, bike rack as such on the wall. Uh, next up's from Mr. or MR uh, in Black Forest in Germany. As a father of two boys who ride like wild animals, um, there's a need to keep order and repair bikes. Yep, I get ya. Um, bikes stay inside the bike cave, the kids in the bike shed. Oh, nice, I like it. <laughs> uh, rails are butcher's gear. Ah, oh, that's a cool idea. Using ropes and sailing gear. That's a very cool idea. So you can just slide the bikes around. Why have we not seen that before? That is brilliant. It does look like your bike might be a little bit wobbly the way it's hanging, but the concept of that is, that's genius. Love it, great idea. Uh, some great bike caves there. Thank you for sending them in. Uh, we'll hopefully see some more in the next show or two. Okay, now we're gonna have a bit of a top mods fest. We've got loads of great ones this week. Uh, if you've done anything cool to your bikes, please take some photos and tell us all about it. Again, upload the links on screen and in the description underneath. And I know this is the last picture in the sequence sent in from Will in uh, Bentonville, but I wanted to show this one first. This is an old bike rack that's turned into like, like a little stool, I guess. You can work on your bike or sit or just use it to sit on in a, in a workshop. That's a great idea. Hmm. Next up, it says it's from James, but I suspect this isn't from James um, because this is a Juliana Strega, uh, 2018 model from Sheffield. I bought my Strega from Stiff Cycles, a uh, brilliant bike shop that. If you don't know about Stiff, look them up. Wicked bike shop, been around for many years. In fact, they've been around in mountain biking since before uh, mountain biking was a thing in the UK. It used to be Stiff Sailboards. They used to sell windsurfing gear um, and they changed to the Stiff Cycles. They, they had a few bikes in the shop um, just because it was a growing thing and they ended up getting more attention for the bike, so they 
gradually moved out all the sailboards and windsurfing stuff and turned into stiff bikes or stiff cycles. Uh, cool random story there. So uh, yeah, your bike looks great. So over the last couple of, couple of years, I've made a lot of changes to the original spec, um, including NS bikes, pedals and stem, Bergtech spacers, top cap and sprocket, uh, deity bars. I'm, I'm loving that color as well. I don't know if it's like coffee or bronze, whatever it is, it's really, really nice. Like Bergtech have nailed that. Um, great brand that. And actually, speaking of Bergtech, I mean, you've got a lot of spacers under that stem there. It, it looks great. But have you considered like lowering the stem and getting that high rise Bergtech bar? bit more money to spend. Um, might neaten it a little bit. Um, that said, it does look really nice. Uh, and it's, it's your bike, it's not mine. But, um, right, so you've got Dibro um, Hawaiian frame protection. That is really cool. That works so well on there. Uh, Nupro seat clamp, DMR death grips, PT's valves, um, Uber bike floating rotors. Always been a bit jealous of my partner's core sprung Nomad. So this month I decided to get caught on my own. Nice. Yeah, replaced my 170mm Lyrics. You are throwing some money on this. Wow. Uh, replaced 170mm Lyrics, which were a brilliant fork, uh, with 180mm Zebs. Painted the spring in a copper colour to match the rest of the bike. That's a serious bit of modification, that. Now I think the bike looks and feels, uh, sorry, feel, feels and looks evil enough to justify the name Strager. Uh, PS, it was great to see the Anka Martin promo video. Yeah, I, I love that video. And Anka is rad. She's so cool, uh, as is Sven, obviously. Um, great couple, great mountain biking couple there. Loving the bike, I think it's really cool. Really good. Uh, next up's from Carlos in Costa Rica. Wow. Hey, Carlos, how you doing? Uh, so it's a Fuji Rakan 1.1. I'm not too familiar. I've seen a few Fujis over the years. I've just finished my new short travel trail build with custom parts. Uh, Fuji with oval chainring, dissector front, recon back, so that's the tires, 120mm frame with the RotoShox Super Deluxe, and a Revelation 130mm fork. It glides up the Costa Rica mountains and purrs like a spaceship on the descent. I love the wording, that's great. I wouldn't change it for anything. Super lightweight aluminium and samurai themed frame protectors on the top and down tubes from all mountain style. Yeah, that stuff's really good actually. It's super tough, isn't it? I've had some of their uh, protectors over the years. Hey, the bike looks great. Really nice. The terrain looks cool as well. What chain ring is that? It looks, it looks a bit, I'm gonna say, it looks like an absolute black. I've got one somewhere. It looks like one of those. Um, either way, it looks great. Nice stuff. And thanks for getting in touch and thanks for watching for Costa Rica. That's rad. Uh, I'd love to visit at some point over there. Okay, next up, what we've got? Oh, we've got a video, this is cool. Um, so this is from Demita in Bulgaria, nice. And the bike is a Ram AM2. Fed up with all my friends having these fancy dropper remotes while I have the old style one, so you've got the lever under the seat. Um, nothing all those, they work great. And you won't have issues with a remote going wrong. But I made my own remote, wireless with battery, just like SRAM access, no way. The difference is I made mine before SRAM, good work. Uh, bought the standard garage door remote, hooked it to an Arduino Mini, I guess that's yeah, a servo motor. Um, so what's that from, like radio control cars or something like that perhaps? I don't know. Um, mini servo motor, connected it to the dropper lever and it worked very well. Oh, you got video as well? Okay, uh, here's the video on screen. That is ace. What a cool approach. I love it when people do stuff like this. Hey, that is so cool. Thank you for sending that in. What a wicked approach. That is so good. That's a proper top mod. In fact, that's, that's one of the coolest ones I've ever seen. I think that's really good. Nice work. Um, and refreshing to see a bit of ingenuity there. Uh, great stuff from everyone. Catch you next week. Okay, so we have some quiz answers for you. So the first question was, uh, what helps make the new Santa Cruz blur so light? Well, essentially it's not having the VPP system on there. So VPP, the virtual pivot point system, is something that Santa Cruz have used um, pretty much from the beginning. They, their first bike was a Tasmon that had a single pivot and then it had the Heckler and then it went into the VPP with the V10 actually, which was their first bike, 250 mil rear wheel travel. Uh, so they basically bought the design concept from Outland who developed the VPP, uh, took it as far as they could and then Santa Cruz basically reconfigured everything. So it's been the sort of anchor point of their suspension bikes and it still is to a large degree. However, on the XC Racing where you really need to dump off every bit of weight possible, especially now the bikes all have 29 inch wheels. All the manufacturers are running fairly similar design frames and it's really to keep the weight down. So you notice in the men's field now, most of the racers are using full suspension bikes. Obviously it does change here and there, but 
you know, it was only a few years ago that the majority were using hardtails and some were using full suspension. So uh, to keep the weight down, they've gone for a single pivot design with what appears to be like a flex stay on the rear and a linkage drive in the shock. So it's very similar to, in concept, to a lot of other platforms out there. Uh, and that's why, basically. Uh, nothing wrong with VPP, it's incredible, and they've still got that on all of their other bikes. It's just purely on this XEO race bike where they literally need to dump off every possible bit of weight possible that they can. They've basically just, they've done exactly that. And uh, next up, what did all Bayer make before bikes? They made rifles and guns. <laughs> um, I never saw that one coming. So, bearing in mind, they started producing bikes in 1930. So, they actually made those like a pretty long time ago. Uh, but interesting stuff, all the same. And the last one is, what is the benefit of having Kashima coating on Fox suspension products? Well, essentially, they've basically anodized like an, a form of oil into the actual anodizing surface. So here's some close-ups of Kashima coating. So if I get this right, the Kashima coating is an anodized layer of molybdenum. Molybdenum? Molybdenum. Something like that. Um, and it's embedded into the surface alloy. So what this essentially does is it gives it a hardened finish that's much slippier. So your fork or your shock arguably work better and for longer. Now it's possible to get the same performance from their other surfaces and on other brands, but the whole thing with Kashima is it's longevity of it. So it's gonna stay working that well for longer. So that's the theory at least. Anyway, how'd you get on with those? Hmm. Good stuff. Uh, right, so end of the show then. So uh, what did you think of the show this week? Leave us some feedback in the comments underneath and uh, we'll see you in the next video. See you later.